So I'm looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls and saying that a lot of these Jewish writings that are dealing with the Genesis 5 and Genesis 9 and the so-called curse on blackness, it's not supported by Genesis 9 in, in the biblical text, the Hebrew Bible, uh, nor is it supported by the Dead Sea Scrolls commentary on Genesis 9 or the to the prigger for commentary that was found the among the Dead Sea Scrolls on Genesis 9. <laughs> Thank you for watching another episode of the G3 Project Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Lisa Fields, the founder of the G3 Project. And today I'm joined by a very special guest, Dr. Jamal Hopkins. Welcome, Dr. Hopkins. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor. It's a blessing to be here. Thank you uh, for accepting the invitation. I first heard of you from Dr. Uh, David Daniels, and he was telling me that there was a, a Black scholar that specialized in Dead Sea Scrolls. And I was like, ah. I've never heard of it before. Uh, so I was like, I got to connect with him. I got to get him on the podcast. Uh, so here you are. So I'm thankful uh, that you accepted the request. For those who don't know who you are, just give us a little bit of background. Well, my name is Jamal Dominique Hopkins, and um, I'm the incoming dean of the Dickerson Green Theological Seminary at Allen University in, in Columbia, South Carolina. And uh, I'm a native of Southern California, but I like to say I'm pretty much from all over the place. Uh, and California runs through my blood. Um, I did my seminary work in California and uh, my undergraduate in Washington, D.C. at Howard University. Did my doctoral work at the University of Manchester in England, where I, I had the honor, uh, had the had the privilege of studying the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, like you said, I, I think I'm probably the only person of African descent uh, who studied the Dead Sea Scrolls and, you know, with the doctoral level. So but I'm happy to be here. That's awesome. Um, because when we think about uh, scholarship, we often don't see uh, minorities represented when we think about like textual criticism. Uh, how many um, African Americans do you know that do work with Dead Sea Scrolls and textual criticism? Are you the only one? I know you're the only one you think for Dead Sea Scrolls, but textual criticism in general. Well, you know, as I've traveled and done work and presentations on the Dead Sea Scrolls and Second Temple Judaism. So the Dead Sea Scrolls would fall within this discipline or this uh, field of Second Temple Judaism. Dead Sea Scrolls would fall under late Second Temple Judaism. So it's essentially the Judaism during the time uh, in which Jesus and the New Testament Gospels uh, took place. Uh, so it's contemporaneous with that. It's kind of a few centuries before that, um, up into that actual time period. So it's contemporaneous with the time uh, which Jesus. And so as I've done research and presentations kind of across the, across the, across the globe, uh, I've seen uh, persons, of, uh, I've seen a few, uh, maybe two or three uh, persons of African descent, primarily uh, from the continent. Um, I would say those who I have met that actually do work on Second Temple Judaism, um, like Enochic studies, things like that, uh, maybe Northern African, uh, Ethiopian, Eastern Africans. Um, and I think that's particularly interesting in that you find within Second Temple work, Second Temple Judaism and the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, of which, uh, you know, Second Temple Judaism, you have uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, Dead Sea Scrolls has a collection of literature, a body of literature that's both biblical or that's biblical uh, to the pigrapha, um and uh, sectarian. And so the, the to the pigrapha work, you find works like Enochic writings or Enochic literature, uh, the Book of Jubilees. And a lot of these writings you actually find preserved in their fullness um, in Ethiopic literature, Eth Ethiopic language. And so that would probably be an interest for some of these Ethiopian or these Northern African, Northern Eastern African uh, scholars. And so I've seen about a handful of them, maybe about three or four. But as far as African Americans, I, I'm the only one having these conversations with myself. <laughs> uh, that's that's a, hopefully uh, this conversation will motivate more people uh, to, to look at look into it and uh, join you. Um, so. Let's just start with the basics of Dead Sea Scrolls. What are the Dead Sea Scrolls for those who are listening and never heard of it? 
uh, or may have heard of it in some kind of way that's been misinterpreted misinterpreted for some kind of conspiracy theory. Uh, what are the, the Dead Sea Scrolls? So the Dead Sea Scrolls are a body of literature, a Jewish uh, corpus of literature uh, that was found um, during the mid 20th century, 1947 to 1956, 54. Um, and so you have this Jewish body of literature that's preserved um, reflecting the second temple period uh, around 200 years before Christ up to the actual you know, centuries Christ actually lived and the disciples actually walked. So I would say from about 200 before Christ to about 67, 64, um, uh, common era. Um, and so they are a Jewish body of literature found preserved in these caves uh, in the Judean hills outside of uh, Jerusalem in Palestine. Um, and they preserve the writings of a Jewish uh, sectarian community. Uh, the community describes itself as a priestly group. They call themselves the Sons of Zadok. And they are this community that actually is residing outside of Jerusalem in a a remote area in the Judean desert. Um, and they remain, or they maintain it's kind of a sectarian purification, if you will. Uh, and so in their body of literature, you find three types of materials, three types of writings. You find biblical writings, primarily Old Testament, what we would understand as Old Testament. They wouldn't refer to them as Old Testament, but uh, they tend to be what we understand now as uh, Old Testament manuscripts, Hebrew Bible manuscripts. Uh, you find sectarian writings, which are writings that reflect that actual principal community that uh, preserved these writings. And you find pseudepigrapher writings, and these writings are writings that uh, purport or supposed to be a lot older than what they are. They're Second Temple writings, but they supposed to be early writings, let's say writings of Enoch, or writings of Moses, or writings of Abraham, you know, writings like that. Uh, so you have these three body of literatures, Jewish, Primarily, all of them were uh, found, recorded, and written in Hebrew. Uh, some uh, small fragments or few fragments are actually written in Greek. Uh, some in Aramaic as well. Mm -hmm. And who found the who found the uh, scrolls? Well, you have a uh, you have a story. You have these Bedouin uh, shepherds who actually tend sheep, tend their goat in the Judean desert, uh, Bedouin. Um, and so the story goes is as as they were tending to their sheep, walking down the wadi or walking down a valley uh, along the Judean hills, you have these hills that kind of overlook the Dead Sea. Um, and so one of them actually throws a rock in these cave openings because you have all of these holes or these cave openings in these in these hills that uh, date way back centuries and centuries back. And as he throws a rock in one of these caves, he hears the shattering of some pottery. Uh, curie, curious, uh, it's late in the evening, uh, but yet curious, uh, They, this young Bedouin shepherd who's with his cousins, they return home. Uh, this Bedouin shepherd who hears this sound, he actually returns to the caves, climbs up in there, and he sees these pottery jars, um, some that are shattered and some that are actually intact, still sealed, and as he opens the seal or opens one of these pottery jars, he actually removes this ancient manuscript or the scroll, if you will. And it has this strange writing and that strange writing, of course, these Bedouin uh, being um, um, Arab shepherds, um, you know, they know their language, but this is the strange writings tend to uh, eventually are Hebrew. And so the story is, is that he takes it to a local antiquities dealer. Um, they're deciphered eventually uh, by some of the scholars in Palestine. And, and this is during uh, a really tumultuous time and period during uh, in Israel, because when the scrolls were actually found in that first cave, that area or that territory was Jordanian territory, but not too long after, uh, because of the release of this Palestinian area and the Six Day War, um, this no longer is Jordanian area, it now becomes part of Jerusalem, Palestine, and the story kind of goes on from there. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's very very interesting. Why um why was why was this discovery so significant? What what um for those who are like oh that's good history, kind of connect the dots for them as to why it's um significant and helpful for us today as believers. 
Well, it's helpful in a number of ways. Uh, it's helpful primarily for this really kind of helps us to get a sense of what Judaism was like during the time Jesus lived. Before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, uh, the Judaism that was supposed to be uh, understood as uh, during the time of Jesus was a kind of Judaism that dated much later than the time period and actually, you know, than Jesus actually lived, the disciples actually walked. And so this actually gives us a portrait or a picture of what Judaism was like. So we know we have the Pharisees, we have the Sadducees, because that's what's described in the New Testament. But you also have the Samaritans, you have a group called the Essenes. And the Essenes are what the majority of us is pri primarily Dead Sea Scrolls scholars um, accept or embrace um, the community, the principal community uh, associated with the Dead Sea Scrolls. We understand them to have been Essenes. And this is kind of described in some of the uh, Jewish uh, historian writings or uh, uh, Josephus and Pliny, because um, they kind of describe the actual community that actually lived in the Judean desert. Uh, and the scrolls actually kind of describe who they are. And so there's kind of this putting this together, uh, this ancient literature from the classical writings to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then you have the archeological material, which actually uh, describes the actual practices that a particular community uh, engaged in as they lived here. They don't tell us actually who the community is, but they tell us the practices. And then the literature kind of tells us some practices of the Essenes and we kind of just piece it all together. Um, so it's important because it lets us know what Judaism was like during the time of Jesus and the disciples. Um, but it also is very important because some of the manuscripts that were found there, the, the Old Testament manuscripts or the Hebrew Bible manuscripts. Um, now this is important because the manuscripts that we have for, let's say, the modern Bibles that we read, they are translations of the most extant or the most um, um, still existing manuscripts that we have. And those manuscripts date to about 1000 after uh, AD, 1000 Common Era or 900 Common Era. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls preserves fragments and manuscripts of the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible that date almost a thousand years earlier. And so what they can, uh, what they do is they actually help us to know that the manuscripts that were used to translate our modern Bibles today, they're fairly accurate um, because we have older manuscripts that prove and test out that the manuscripts that we have are fairly accurate. What they also do is they also help for not just New Testament scholarship, but for Old Testament scholarship and Jewish scholarship that we have this Old Testament that was recorded in Greek. Uh, the Septuagint. The Septuagint uh, for Jewish scholars was uh, kind of dismissed as maybe a Hellenistically influenced because there are some variances with the Masoretic text, uh, which is the manuscripts that we have used uh, to translate our modern Bibles, the Old Testament, uh, and the Septuagint. There's some there's some discrepancies. So you have 151 Psalms, let's say, in the Septuagint, 150 Psalms uh, in uh, the Masoretic. Well, it's not necessarily a a Greek or Hellenistically influenced uh, text, um, which uh, talks or which suggests these variances. But what you found at, at, at Qumran or among the Dead Sea Scrolls, and Qumran is actually the setting where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, uh, the hit in the hills is the site of Qumran. Uh, you find uh, these, um, the, uh, you find that you find the source of the, of the Septuagint in Hebrew. And so this basically, and this essentially says that the Septuagint is not a Hellenistically influenced uh, Old Testament version or Hebrew Bible version. The Septuagint, this source is actually found in Hebrew and it's very much Jewish, very much has this Jewish Hebraic um, root, if you will. So it's, it's significant in that sense. Uh, it tests out a lot of the manuscripts that we have as being accurate and legitimate. Um, and that's very important for New Testament. Uh, and Old Testament Hebrew Bible studies. That's awesome. That That is definitely helpful when we think about apologetics um, yes. and defending the faith, uh, because one of the um, thoughts as far as um, manuscripts and copying is that it's been mishandled. So to have older texts that are a thousand years um, before the ones we had before, it helps uh, dispel this myth that people are manipulating along the way. And um, yes. can you talk a little bit about how things were transcribed? Because I think uh, 
there's this notion of carelessness that people think about when they think about um, transcription of, of biblical texts. And um, because they think of the carelessness, they don't think that it was preserved in the in the in a in a way that that we could trust. Right. Uh, well, so you have so many different manuscripts, so many variances of manuscripts, if you will, uh, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, and so when you begin to look at all of the various manuscripts and you begin to look at what these manuscripts say, so this is what textual criticism does. You begin to see that there are lots of similarities. Now, discrepancies might be maybe some word spellings or some things like that. So in Hebrew, uh, you may have kind of uh, two types of spellings of a common name, a common name. So you have, uh, let's take in Hebrew, Elohim, God. Uh, Elohim is in this plural form of El, uh, God or gods. Um, you may have a full or a um, uh, a full or uh, plane spelling of it, or you may have a defective uh, a defective plane spelling. So a full spelling might actually use vowels. They actually may use consonants to uh, as vowels, if you will. A more defective or shortening uh, spelling may not necessarily use those uh, consonants, but you have those consonants because before the Masoretic text came out, you didn't have vowels. There's no vowel pointing. The Masoretes uh, vowel pointed everything. So you actually have the vowel consonants used as vowels. So you may have different spellings in some of the manuscripts, but that doesn't necessarily change the content, if you will. Um, and, you know, there may be some other small variances or small discrepancies. But once you begin to look at all of these uh, collections of manuscripts for both the Old Testament, they are the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, you begin to see that we have a faith, a fairly faithful, accurate um, transcription or translation, if you will, or, or transcribing, if you will. Translation would be something, uh, something a little bit different. Because you know, translation is how do we under how do we actually what are the actual terms that we use? So I I kind of like to use the Song of Solomon text. Um, so you have this Vav conjunction that means and or but. And so the Song of Solomon one five reads, uh, "I am black uh, and beautiful. Or I am black but beautiful." And most of the English translation that we read outside of maybe about two or three, they use "I am black" or "I am dark but lovely," uh, and only two or three of these English. Uh, tr um, uh, versions of, of, of that song of Solomon 1 5 say I'm black and lovely or I'm black and or, or dark and lovely and so those are two different interpretations but you have this Bob in the Hebrew this Bob conjunction that can be legitimately translated as but or and and so it just depends on who the translator is that actually is giving life or giving interpretation to that uh, text yeah, that's that's really helpful. Um, and I like how you use that uh, particular um, text because us being African-Americans, uh, black and lovely uh, yes. to us in a, in a different way, black but lovely. Uh, that's the, the, the hair care product, black. Yeah, about <laughs> black and lovely. I, when you said that, I was like, I wonder if they got that from that. But uh, uh, maybe, maybe so. Maybe it's just an interesting coincidence. <laughs> Uh, what what materials were um, the 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 scrolls made of? Uh, they were actually the animal skin. So how we actually how Dead Sea Scrolls scholarship legitimized the uh, the authenticity of these writings were uh, they did DNA testing. Now that's problematic because if you have these ancient rare manuscripts, you don't want to do too much tearing of them to try to test them DNA wise, but that's actually what they did some of the early uh, scholars to try to uh, test and uh, legitimize their authenticity. They actually did some DNA testing. So they were animal skins. Um, so they actually treated these, uh, the, uh, these skinned animals in what you would call a tannery, uh, and they were treated um, for it to be uh, preserved and actually rewritten on, if you will. So, uh, whereas the Hebrew Bible, you have the scrolls because you have, if you can imagine a scroll where you unroll it and roll it back up. Um, New Testament uses more codex or codices. Um, those are used or those are made off of palm reeds or you have all these palm trees in the Palestinian area and they use those and they treat those to actually 
be writing materials and they actually have a codex, which is like a book form. Um, but the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, and more of these uh, ancient Old Testament or Hebrew Bible writings were actually scrolls and they were, uh, animal skins were used. And so, um, uh, of course, you know, being a, a, a religious community and interested in purification, of course, they, they, uh, they wanted purified animals, if you will, uh, for, um, for writing. That's helpful to know. Um, can you just share a little bit about what their community looked like? Because um, you said these gave um, a more insight to their community. Um, what other things came from that revelation of the Dead Sea Scrolls um, that shed light on that community during that time? Well, you have the practices that uh, the uh, archaeological data or archaeological data. So we 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 suggest or there's a suggestion that the archaeological practices are defined so you find um, ink wells uh, among some of the archaeological discoveries you find uh, cisterns or these big large um, cut out uh, basins if you will some that have steps some that don't have steps uh, so we understand this is a ritual bath area this is the place where those in the community would be uh, would ritually bathe themselves but the disposition of space at the at the site, Qumran, um, it looks like a kind of a temple setting because as you move closer and closer into the actual community, uh, you have uh, it would be you know a purified place. You have cisterns uh, systematically or strategically placed as you enter closer closer into the community. Outside of the community, uh, you have um, you have a main cemetery and you have an ancillary cemetery. Now here's, this is some interesting thing uh, and anthropological uh, reports have suggested is that you have uh, primarily all male individuals that were uh, residents at this community, but their heads, their skulls were buried and they all were facing towards the South. And so it suggests that here's a particular practice or here's a particular custom that um, you know, to me, being you know the only one and only African American or one of the only African uh, persons of African descent, looking at this anthropological report and looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, to me that says okay, there are some similarities with Egyptian burial customs here, uh, facing the head towards the south, uh, and they're not burying them with dirt, but they're burying them and they're covering them, covering them with rocks. So there's some similarities here. Um, in the community or at the site, you also find pottery, uh, you find coins. And so as you do archaeological data or archaeological studies, you find different layers or different strata, if you will. There's a community and their practices um, are, uh, are shown um, because it, you find the, the, the evidence on this level. And as you dig deeper, you find other different types of evidence or, arche or artifacts, if you will which suggests maybe different types of practices or maybe a different time period. And you begin to dig deeper and deeper and you find all these various layers. And there are about three layers or three strata of archeological finds or archeological evidence that suggests that there are at least three phases of occupation among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but going back to uh, the anthropological finds, um, so me being a person of African descent, me being a person of color, and you asked the question a little bit earlier but earlier about the relevance. I, as I look at these finds and I look at some of these um, similarities with African, you know, Egyptian burial customs and looking at the proximity to where Qumran is, this Judean desert, Palestinian region uh, to Northern Africa. Uh, and then I begin to look at some of the texts, the Dead Sea Scrolls text. Uh, one particular passage I look at is I look at the commentary on Genesis and I find actually something there in Genesis 9 uh, that makes a comment about the Noahic curse. Uh, and then if I look a little bit deeper and I find some pseudepigrapher writings among the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I also find a reference to this Genesis 9, uh, the Noahic curse. And what this says is it, and it's pretty much uh, con, uh, consistent with what Genesis 9 in the Hebrew Bible talks about when Noah became drunk, planted a vineyard, um, his son, Ham, went in and saw his father's nakedness, whatever that means. Uh, he told his brothers. And so when Noah had woken from his drunkenness, he knew what his youngest son had done and he had cursed uh, Ham's son. 
And so here you have a commentary on that Genesis 9 passage. And there's not a curse on Ham, but there's a curse on Ham's son. And, that, and so this pseudepigrapher writing from the Dead Sea Scrolls makes that clear. This comes from the Book of Jubilees. And the commentary on Genesis 9 uh, found uh, among the Dead Sea Scrolls makes that clear. But here's you have a conversation with some of the rabbinic writings of the third to the eighth century common era, which curses blackness and curses Ham. And the question that begins to be asked is, where do these writings come from? What informs them? Because a lot of these writings from the rabbinic period uh, are supposed to be filling in the gaps is pretty much that's what rabbinic uh, interpretations or rabbinic interpreters say. They're trying to fill in the gaps. Um, but here you have a lot of these writings They connect Genesis 5 to Genesis 9, and they curse Ham and they curse blackness. And some of these texts get really interesting where they talk about because um, you know, they, they connect them back to the, the flood and they say, because you jested at my misfortune, uh, talking about Ham to Noah, uh, and you, uh, and you spoke, uh, about, you know, uh, in, in a negative way or whatever, um, your lips shall protrude, uh, your hair will be twisted in kinks, uh, and your male members or your, um, um, your, your genitals shall be elongated. Now, this is this is in this rabbinic, some of these early rabbinic writings from um, the, uh, the, the Talmud, if you will, uh, from the Tanaitic literature and from some of the Amoraic period literature as well, from the Jewish writings. And so this has some significance with, now we see during the antebellum period, during American slavery, you have some writers, and especially you have uh, one particular um, Jewish um, Rabbi, his name is Rabbi Rafal, uh, and this is a kind of uh, really depicted in Mark Knoll's Civil War as a Theological Crisis. He's going around and he's um, referring to some of these rabbinic interpretations as saying blackness is cursed. Therefore, there's a legitimacy and there's a biblical support for black people to be enslaved uh, because of these writings. And so now, although racism didn't exist during this time, you know, third century to eighth century. Uh, common error, you have to ask yourself the question, what type or what level of ethnocentrism, eth ethnocentrism was going on here? Um, so, so I'm looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls and saying that a lot of these Jewish writings that are dealing with the Genesis 5 and Genesis 9 and the so-called curse on blackness, it's not supported by Genesis 9 in, in the biblical text, the Hebrew Bible, uh, nor is it supported by the Dead Sea Scrolls commentary on Genesis 9 or the to the prigger for commentary that was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls on Genesis 9. And so those rabbinic writings to me, uh, looking at uh, the biblical text and to the prigger for writings and the Dead Sea Scrolls writing causes me to have a kind of a hermeneutic of suspicion, a heavy hermeneutic of suspicion with regard to these Jewish rabbinic writings. Uh, and so that's the way I kind of use these texts uh, for contemporary relevance, uh, particularly for, uh, you know, we as people of color are concerned. Mm -hmm. that's, I know that's kind of a mouthful. But. No, that's, that's very helpful. So you're saying, I want to make sure I get this right. The rabbinic writings that, um, that say these kind of negative things about Africans were not discovered with the Dead Sea Scrolls. No, they were not discovered oh, with the Dead Sea Scrolls. So you're saying the that Dead, Dead, Dead Sea Scrolls kind of, um, kind of uh this the Dead Sea Scrolls helped dispel the the false narratives yes. that the rabbinic scrolls um that came later um kind of perpetuated is that is that a right, right okay I just right yeah and then these, these are, yeah and these are these would be these uh, these commentaries these rabbinic commentaries on the Genesis 5 the Genesis 9 account uh, that's cursing uh, blackness and cursing half uh, so yeah the, so the Dead Sea Scrolls are helpful as we're doing readings, as we're doing our exegesis, as we're doing our interpretation of biblical writings, uh, New Testament and Old Testament is, uh, uh, equally. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of the way that I use them, you know, and, and in that way, I, you know, you can, you can preach them in the church, um, you know, just find a, a, a good way to, to do that. That's, that's helpful. Cause I mean, I think because the, the benefit and, and of doing doing this as with African descent is that you're able to help connect the dots and dispel false narratives yes. 
that that our white brothers and sisters just may not see or may not just it just may not make the connection right. because that's not their experience. Um, so it leaves right. it back. Um, but that that is very helpful um, because it helps us dispel. Because one of the things that we're engaging with students and just millennials is that Christianity is used to further oppress. Then there's mm -hmm. the curse of Ham, um, and so what you're articulating is that yes, there's rabbinic literature that perpetuate that narrative. But if we look further back in history, which is what we try to do, push people further back to look at the whole picture, you'll see that uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls that were dated earlier help us dispel those false narratives, um, even in rabbinic literature um, that were misused. To, to further oppress us as Africans. So that's extremely helpful. Um, you talked about um, the book of Enoch and that is a hot topic in some in some churches. Uh, what, what are your thoughts um, on the book of Enoch being discovered with the Dead Sea Scrolls and how should we think about the book of Enoch in, a, in our time today? Well, like most of the sectarian writings and the Tudor Pickerford writings, uh, Enochic literature uh, would be a part of the collection of Tudor Pickerford, Tudor Pickerford writings. Tudor Pickerford just simply means falsely ascribed. And during the Second Temple period, there was a genre for that, a genre for Tudor Pickerford writing. So here you have an author who is writing uh, supposedly or purportedly in the, in the writing of Han or, or Enoch, if you will. Uh, it's not Enoch because it's Second Temple writings. Uh, Enoch is much earlier. And so this is a kind of common genre, common literature, if you will, at that particular time. And, and it just kind of helps us, I think, if we look at that, we look at uh, what types of genre, written genre, there were. Um, it's, it's attempting to, uh, uh, if you will, to capture the spirit. I think of those particular biblical characters or those particular biblical periods. Um, and so I think if we read them like that, uh, it's preserving uh, kind of a historical period. Uh, this was some uh, literature that preserved and, and it rep represents this type of genre, which we don't typically have because if we think of pseudepigraphers today, uh, pseudographs, uh, we think of plagiarism. And so because we live in a different time, uh, then that particular time in the Second Temple period, uh, to the Pigrapha writings or to the writings or synonymous writings or plagiarized writings um, aren't um, embraced or accepted uh, today. So uh, a preservation of history, preservation of our time, preservation of, of you know, what thought was, uh, and um, you know, they're, you know, they're not authoritative, nor are they lost. I, I don't you know, I, I look at these, you know, you walk into the airport and see the lost books of the Bible. Well, they're not, they're not lost, they're, they're there. You, you look hard, they're, they're just not part of the canon uh, because, you know, canon is clearly about uh, God's interest in redeeming humanity, uh, salvation, uh, the fall of humanity. And so these kinds of writings, this kind of genre just doesn't fit with that, but yet it's still part of, the history is part of that particular time period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think Jude. Um, you're also a New Testament scholar, so you you're you're familiar with the connection uh, with the Book of Jude and the Book of Enoch. Um, yes, yes. And so people will say, well, we should take it as can canonical uh, because it's in it's referenced in the Book of Jude, um, which there. I mean, there's so many other ways you can look at that. Uh, but that is one of the reasons I think there is a sometimes a interest in it more so than the other uh, the book other uh, books. Because can you name the other ones that are that are um, in that? Well, well, you have you have the Book of Jubilees. Uh, so th these are be pseudo for writings. Uh, one of one of the books of Enoch would be the Book of Watchers. Um, you know, you have this Enochic collection, this Enochic corpus. The Dead Sea Scrolls and two of the Pickerford for writing that were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, a lot of them were fragmented, fragmentary or fragmented. Um, so you find very few full intact manuscripts, if you will. So we will find fragments. So you find um, Book of Jubilees, you find uh, Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice. Um, some say that's part of the 
Qumranic sectarian writing. Some say it's part of the uh, to the Pricker for writing. So you have writings like that. Um, Song of the Sabbath Sacrifice talks about what uh, you know heaven is like, what sacrifice or what purification uh, is like in the heavenlies, uh, and it divides the book uh, according to kind of a calendrical um, time for sacrifice. Um, and uh, so, yeah, you know, this, these are some uh, interesting writings, um, and uh, I think they give history, historical background, just similar to the way uh, the uh, deuterocanonical works, uh, like the Book of Maccabees, uh, Bell and the Dragon. They, they, they give us a historical framework. Um, so, like, if we were to describe our 21st century or 20th century um, period, um, in you know next 500 years to those who live in that particular time, they would look at a lot of the different historical. They would look at a lot, a lot of the literature. Uh, they look at social media. They look at some of the newspapers. They, uh, you know, and, and they would just kind of give a get a full 3D dimensional picture of what uh, the historical time and period was like. And so I think that's what these writings um, help us to get a three dimensional picture of what time was really like during you know during this time. Awesome. That's that's very helpful. Is there anything um, before we close that we may have not talked about as it relates to the Dead Sea Scrolls that you think is important for our audience to know? I think with, with the Dead Sea Scrolls and what goes along with the Dead Sea Scrolls would be the archaeological material um, of which you find anthropological material and how this gets into a conversation with classical writing, Josephus, Philo and Pliny. Um, but also that historical period and that 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 geography, if you will, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and this kind of the way that I'm looking at it from a person of African descent, I'm looking at uh, the presence of a temple, a Jewish temple, that was found uh, in Egypt uh, around 150, uh, 160 before Christ, uh, and so this kind of breathes or kind of connects what I think to what we have, Qumran studies, Second Temple uh, studies. Um, and it says that, what do you have a Jewish temple where you're expected to make sacrifices in a Jewish temple, not in Jerusalem, but in, in Egypt? And so you have to understand that historical period, there was lots of tension. Uh, you have the Maccabees and the Syrians actually uh, in control of that Palestinian area, and the temple is viewed as defiled, which caused the uh, people of Qumran and the people of the Dead Sea Scrolls to actually leave Jerusalem in the first place. Um, and so there may be some connection with this Northern African temple, because you have uh, um, a temple, because at that particular time, you have the Syrian ruler Antiochus, who oust or who bans or expels uh, the Jewish priest at that particular time. And here for the only period in Jewish history, you have a Jewish temple that is not occupied by a priest. And that priest's name was Onias. Uh, there was Onias, his father and his son. And they were Zadok priests. And Zadok's, um, they were the priests that David and uh, during David and Solomon's time. And so Onias is a priest. He's a, uh, a Zadok priest. The people in Qumran and in the Dead Sea Scrolls literature they describe themselves as the sons of Zadok. And so you have this connection um, potentially with these people of Qumran, these people among the Dead Sea Scrolls, with potentially this Northern African um, context where you have a Jewish temple that's set up in Egypt, uh, occupied by a son of Zadok, a Zadok priest. And the people of among the Dead Sea Scrolls, the principal community understood themselves as priestly are the sons of Zadok. They were a priestly community. And so there's some connection there. And so what I like to tell people is that when it comes to Judaism and Christianity, especially when we look at Tom Odin's writings, um, Judaism and Christianity, for me, Christianity is birthed out of an African seed bread. Um, Judaism goes way back into uh, Northern Africa because you constantly see this connection uh, and interchange of people going in and out of Palestine. Uh, these are two ancient African religious traditions, Judaism and Christianity. And so if a person of African descent wants to find their historical lineage and roots, I say look in the biblical text and you'll find yourself, you'll find your 
your, your historical lineage and roots within the biblical text. So that dispels the question, is the Bible and is Christianity the white man's religion? No, uh, that's a trick of the enemy. I come from a Pentecostal background, that's, that's a trick of the devil. Um, Judaism and Christianity are part of ancient, ancient African religious traditions, and their people of color will find themselves uh, within the biblical text and the biblical story. That's helpful, and that's a great way to, to end our conversation. Before we go, what books would you recommend, and how can get people get in contact with you on social media? Uh, I would recommend uh, probably the most successful text would be James Vanderkam, uh, The Dead Sea Scrolls Today. And it was just released in a updated version, I think, probably about six years ago. Uh, James Vanderkam, The Dead Sea Scrolls Today. Um, I have I have some articles floating around. If you want to kind of Google me, uh, Jamal Dominique Hopkins, uh, have a few articles out there. Um, um, you can follow me on Facebook or Twitter. Not quite sure how to do that. Jamal Hopkins Twitter, or Jamal Dominique Hopkins Twitter or Facebook. Uh, just kind of you know kind of Google me, and, and you you should be able to find me. Maybe I can uh, um, send you some links, and you can kind of help uh, your audience try to figure uh, find me. Awesome. I'll search for you on uh, Twitter um, and then at, put the at sign when we post it on Twitter so people can, okay. can find you on that. That means I actually have to start start using my Twitter now. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Hopkins. This has been a rich conversation and I think our audience will really enjoy it. Oh, well, thank you, Lisa. I appreciate it.